Hey guys, brand new podcast. Hey guys, brand new. Hey guys, brand new. Hey guys, brand new. I'm on a, I, sometimes I feel like I want to talk to someone who's bipolar. I feel like I get on a high and I manage that high. Like I, what happened this morning is I got up early. We have a great podcast, by the way. Bert, you're all over the map. I know this is what happens to me. I'm not managing it right now. I haven't been drinking for like two days, three days, and I feel phenomenal. I ran up. Oh, you're probably wondering what's going on with Tommy Buns. We'll talk about it on the next Two Bears, One Cave. Uh, what? You haven't heard about it? I have, but this is the reason why the podcast is so late this week. Oh, that's right. So the pod- I apologize that the podcast is late. Um, I was in the hospital with my best friend, Tommy Buns, um, getting him situated. Uh, I think very, very mildly, I can say very mildly, like it, I'm, 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 I'm kind of a, a, a little hard, rough to talk about because I don't know if you guys know this, but Tom is a very, very private person. He is very, very private, like, I, like extremely private. Like, like I didn't post anything on social media yesterday as I sat in the hospital with him all day. I just didn't because he, he, that's not him. I wanted to show a picture of the affected areas, which I won't even talk about in detail. But I will say it was a, I think what we will call a double fracture, uh, two bones broken. We were doing something for uh, two bears, one cave. And uh, and I didn't post anything. And he's very private. So I'm going to let Tommy take care of this and say what he wants to say. We will be talking about it on two bears, one cave. Not this next week. This next week we already recorded. But the following week, we will be talking about it. Probably not Tom. Maybe a guest host. I don't think he's moving anywhere for a while. I don't mean to laugh. I've been with him so much that I've watched him piss in a bottle. I've watched. I've I've seen him get loaded up on Dilaudid. I helped to ha- had to help reset his arm. It's it's been it has been trying. All I'll say is everyone um, that had tickets to him in San Santa Blay this weekend. That's definitely not happening. And uh, and bear with him. Bear with him. It's it's suffice to say you will get all the information pretty fucking intense that's not putting it lightly am i or is that putting it lightly i don't know anyway but so that's why the podcast is late i was in the hospital with tom all day yesterday and he's doing well i talked to him he is in good spirits i talked to him this morning he's in good spirits uh and uh he should be out by the end of the weekend i think they're going to do some procedures procedures uh to him to get him up and going but he's not it man let me tell you something that motherfucker's a savage I watched there's there's friend moments. You get friend moments, right? Where you go, oh bro. The uh I'll just say like there's some a couple moments that happen where you do two dudes look each other in the eye and they're like, whew, whew. I have so I've been I've been fucking trying to process a lot of this because I witnessed the accident, which was absolutely horrific. Um I witnessed the aftermath of the accident. And that is where you're waiting for an ambulance to show up. I witnessed him dealing with the ambulance. I I witnessed things that I can't get out of my mind. And I, and ironically, those, a lot of those things make Tom laugh hysterically. They do not make me laugh hysterically. And I witnessed, uh, I witnessed fucking things that you, that I don't know, man, I don't have that. I don't have that, that core, just, just like making a phone call to a wife, explaining we're going to the hospital or, or we're going to, help someone get down a flight of stairs who, who can't use his body or it's fucking intense. I don't need to say this cause he knows it. I love Tommy. And if you're listening to Tommy, you know, I love you, you know, motherfucker, you know, I love you. Oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of one moment where the doctor's like, Hey, just give me a heads up. We're gonna have to reset your arm, man. If Tom Segura has ever made you laugh and just how dry he is, you should have seen the look on this dude's face. He was like, what did you just say? Anyway, I got to get going because I got to go do Kelly Clarkson. I think I'll be on Kelly Clarkson today. I don't know when they air them, but uh, shout out to my brother. Shout out to my brother, my best friend in the world, Tom Segura. I hope him a speedy recovery. I will be there for him every step of the way. We are, have not announced it yet, but we shot something that will be happening coming up. Big show. Check out Two Bears, One Cave this uh, this Monday, this coming Monday for big announcements. And uh, 
Oh, this podcast is brought to you by, wait, let me get my glasses. Hold on. This podcast is brought to you by Established Titles. I love Established Titles. Look, if you're looking for a gift to give someone this Christmas, this is a brilliant gift for the guy or woman that you don't know what to get. You can become a Lord Established Titles.com and help any, and you also help out woodland conservation efforts at the same time. How does it work? Okay. In Scotland, landowners have long been referred to as Lairds, which is Lord. All you need is one square foot of land. Established Titles. Lordships and ladyships title packs are based on this historic principle of land ownership customs. They plant a tree for every order and offer a title pack with plots ranging from one square foot to 10 square feet in Huntley, Scotland. So you can make anyone, including yourself. I'm a Lord. I'm a Lord. I got a beautiful little picture goes up and the title pack started as low as $49.99. Come with a personalized certificate, which I am hanging in my new man cave and a unique plot number, a plot dedicated land on a private state estate in scotland highlands that you can visit anytime uh this is so great i've been making my daughters call me lord kreischer and it's it's just a fun great gift this is the person that you don't know what to get make them a lord with established title pack established titles.com so also if they're scottish like leanne it's a great way to honor their heritage established titles is currently offering buy one get one free for their black friday cyber monday sales our listeners can go to established titles dot com slash black friday and get a lordship title and have another title for free that's established titles.com slash black friday to become a lord today this podcast is a good one i think i did a good job now this is not my skill set as you know i'm not an amazing interviewer i'm not joe rogan i can't get a dude to come in and then do every ounce of joe's amazing at that shit and that's why his podcast is what it is bill burr's amazing at that shit that's why when we do bill burt Bill bringing people, but he'll know the subject we're talking about. I am not that guy. I have a few interests. It's stand up. Uh, it, it's pretty much stand up. Like that's my interest. I'm in love with stand up. I love stand up. I love promotion. Whatever. I got to get going anyway. Um, but this dude, it's interesting. Passion begets passion, right? And Slipknot is a band where their fans are fucking uber passionate so if you're looking for information on slipknot the world wide web is ready to give and they give by the way i have so many fucking questions i wish because now i got into a slipknot hole right i do the research we get ready i want to get ready for Corey, so i make and now i'm like i have so many questions about clowns i want to hear about sid breaking his heels like there's so much shit i want to know about slipknot because the way it works is you google a little slipknot and then anything Corey taylor slipknot apparently says they're going to release a new album next year that's a new one by the way just got that on my oh that's my phone number just got that on my information and so i'm getting news and I'm obsessed with Slipknot. I've been running to Slipknot on the treadmill nonstop. I played Slipknot in the car for the girls. And I was like, this is the kind of music I like. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. This is a, I think this is a great interview. Halston is a huge Slipknot fan. He jumps at the end. So if you're a Slipknot fan and you're like, Burr's not bringing it, skip to the last 15 minutes and let Halston interview him because Halston jumps in. But regardless, Corey Taylor is an amazing dude. Amazing dude. An amazing performer, dude. When we, you talked about vote, we talk about vocal warm ups. We talk about Slipknot. We talk about the mask. We talk about uh, all the all the layman questions. And then Halston, when we talk about vocal warm ups and 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 albums, and it it's really fascinating, especially now listening to his music and going, "Fuck, how do you warm that voice up?" Without further ado, the lead singer of Slipknot, Corey Taylor. He's the man. <laughs> how you doing man uh you know quarantine life is awesome yeah where are you are you in vegas yeah i'm in vegas damn what's has vegas has vegas shut down are we started alston yeah has uh has vegas uh by the way i gotta start off and say thank you for doing this podcast dude you have no idea like i'm a i'm a big fan so the, the no second, for real like the second they said, would you like to do, I couldn't hit yes fast enough. I was so down. Absolutely, dude. I, I had a genuine spit take. I was watching one of your specials and when you were sitting down for, uh, I, want to th- I want to say it was like one of your kids, like kindergarten meetings, and you had the, you had the Bud Light in your fucking pocket, dude. <laughs> I, I, I was fucking on the floor, dude. Oh, fuck so yeah, rad. Dude. Like, so the feelings mutual, I fucking love it. I'm, I'm just stoked to be here. 
I've been I've been binging Slipknot on the treadmill this past week. Oh like, right, right. Nonstop. And and then uh, and then we're doing a movie, and uh, the for, based on the machine. And oh. we were, we had meeting today, and I said, you know, I got Corey Taylor on, and both fucking guys lost their shit. My my writer was the writer of our movie. It was like, dude, have you heard his new solo album? I mean, Black Eyes Blues. I mean, are you fucking kidding me? CM CMFT, and I, and then. And then my director was like, dude, you just fucked my head up. Now we got to get some Slipknot in the movie. <laughs> I was like, Fuck, yeah. Whatever, hey, whatever you guys want, man. Fucking I'll, I'll, I'll get it cleared. Absolutely. Dude, I, yeah, uh, yeah it's been, uh, and, then I've, and then I was doing research today and I was like, God, man, I feel like we could have been the same dude in, in so many respects. And, right. <laughs> but, except for the fact that you've been sober for 10 years. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is that. Did you, when you party, did you put just, what was it about partying that you fit? Like, I never understand that, that like taking it too far where you're like, I got to stop. I was, well, I mean, I was the, the perpetual binger though. Like really? I, didn't, I didn't have a off switch. I would wake up and immediately start drinking again. So I was like, yeah, like I was, my addictive gene is so gnarly like, and I have it in everything. I have it in yeah. collecting. I have it in fucking candy bars. Oh, I'm going to eat 20 of these motherfuckers, right? Oh, it's that, like, I, but I also have this weird switch where once I'm done, that's it. I'm done. And, and I'm like, I've never done treatment. I've never done AA. I've never done anything. I just went done. And that's, and it, once I make that decision, I just fucking stick to it, man. So it's, I don't know what it is and why. But dude, I would go, I can't, if I had a nickel for every morning, I woke up in a place I didn't know. And I was just like, <laughs> what the, how the fuck did I get here? It's crazy shit, dude. So yeah, it's probably best for everyone that I've been sober. That's cool. Yeah, I have a, I have that, I have that impulse where I, I, it's almost like my, I go, I feel like a shark where my eyes go in the back of my head and I don't see anything anymore. Right. And if I wake up, but. Not so much with drugs and alcohol. I don't know why, but for whatever, drugs always scared me. Um, right, right. Well, I think I had bad experiences on marijuana when I was fourteen. Right, and and it and that the being able to not control it and being too high, right, scared the living shit out of me. With See, drugs. I that could be like I'm uh, slightly allergic to it, which is one of the reasons. What? Yeah, like I'm like it's one of the reasons why. My when I used to like I'd smoke weed, I'd smoke weed like very, very, very randomly, you know, like yeah. not a lot because I just I was the same way. I, I never had a good experience, man. I would always get like super fucking gnarly, and then it felt like it lasted for hours. It was like it was like the worst acid trip. You're just like, when's it gonna fucking stop? And just yeah. not happy. And I was I went to the doctor and I got tested for a bunch of random shit. And I have a, a fucking slight marijuana fucking uh, uh, allergy. Allergy, yeah. And I was like, well, fucking, that's why, you know. So I, I was happy not to fucking smoke weed. I also don't like the the smell of it. Like, I'm not a huge fan of the smell. But I was a speed kid when I was growing up. Was it? I, I, I got to tell you, man. For just for a second, Des Moines, Iowa, has a special place in my heart because I've performed there. So many times, right? Probably the funny bone, right? Funny or, bone, yeah. Funny bone. Paul Lane, Paul Lane owned that place, and he'd bring me in for for cheap for him, but it was a lot of money for me at the time. You know, twelve hundred bucks, fifteen hundred bucks, right, man. Yeah, and he'd bring me in a big lot, big. like a right. lot. Yeah, I I feel like every time you came through town, I was either gone or on the fucking road, or like yeah. So like, but I used to go down there and see uh, acts all the fucking time, dude. Like I like I'm like massive comedian fan like i so just what, love, what comics do you like well i grew up with uh carlin yeah uh prior obviously but i like i liked like old lenny bruce like the shit like before he started getting like weird yeah. game of consciousness like when he was still doing bits like he was really really funny you know um but i was also <laughs> strangely enough i was a massive cosby fan so you can imagine what the last few years have been like for me <laughs> <laughs> crazy man that's good yeah that's uh i always wonder what you're you're what are you are you 46 uh yeah i'll be 47 in december like in a month i'll be 47 yeah the um 
what was what were drugs like in Des Moines back in the 80s, like 80s, 90s? Like, was speed floating around then? Oh, yeah, big time. And I was living in Waterloo, Iowa, which is about two hours northeast of Des Moines. Because I, I ended up moving to Des Moines to get sober, actually, strangely enough, to, like, to get away from the drugs. Is uh, Waterloo, they used to call it Little Detroit. Like, super gnarly, super dangerous, a lot of crime, really poor, like, fuck. And it was, you know, you grew up, I grew up super poor. So it was just like hand to mouth. You ate or gobbled whatever the fuck you could get in your mouth, you know? And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of speed, a lot of like cheap Coke. Uh, uh, meth was like real crank was starting to go at the time. So it was like, we did it so we could stay up and just keep partying and drinking and shit. You know, it's like there was, there were times I'd be up for five days, you know, just like just out of my mind, you know, wake up in the woods somewhere where I was just like, Oh shit. But then I OD'd twice. And, uh, I was like, I had, I had, I had to stop. Like, so it was, it was pretty available. And because the shit was stepped on, it wasn't super expensive, you know, but at the same time, like I ran with a crew that like stole cars and shit to, to make money. So we would just pass the shit around like yeah just i mean just doing nuts shit i'm lucky to be alive let's put it that are way. you an only child no i had a sister uh the sister on my mom's side and then i didn't know my dad i didn't meet my dad until i was 30 and i found out i have siblings on that side as well but i grew up grew up with uh my sister who's five years younger than me this sounds weird but did when because you you were you you were successful when eminem came out Right. Like you guys were already successful. Did you ever feel like when you, and I know it's different genres, but I know that you kind of float genres a little bit. Did you ever right, feel like right. a kinship to him? Like going, Oh, you grew up poor. I grew up poor. You made it out. Like, like, I could, oh, let me yeah. Go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm massive, massive M fan. Man. Like, and, and the thing is, is like, I loved anybody from the, from the Midwest. Cause I still considered Michigan like the Midwest. Yeah. I loved anybody from the Midwest who made it, you know, like, so not only was I into Eminem, but I was also into Prince. Because Prince was uh, Minneapolis, right? Yeah. So that was like, to me, that was like the grail. I was like, oh, fuck, you know? So it was like anybody like that. And especially knowing his background, I was like, dude, it was like looking in a fucking mirror sometimes. It was crazy. Yeah, so 311's from Omaha. <laughs> right, yeah. But they don't claim it anymore, which I think is horse shit. Wait, what do, they, what do you mean they don't yeah, claim it? Yeah, man, no. For like 10 years, they didn't claim Omaha. We, we And for the longest time, we were like, they were like, we're fucking 311 from Los Angeles. I'm like, you're full of shit. God damn it. You're from fucking Noma. <laughs> we used to see you at the ranch bowl, you pricks. You know? <laughs> so what I'm an the, asshole. Don't listen to me. What was the first? I'm always fast. I'm fast. There, there are like themes that I, that, um, that amaze me. And, and one of the ones is. I, I, I want to talk first about like, what was it like to get the first hint of success? Oh man. I mean, well, I mean, there were certain levels too. I mean, cause so there were the levels like you, so you go, you, you're in, you're in, um, you're in, um, uh, fucking stone sour before right. slipknot, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're in stone sour. You join slipknot slipknot kind of blows up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were stone sour and slipknot were the, the, the two biggest bands in town in Des Moines and slipknot was basically almost like the super group. It was made up of people from other bands that were completely driven, completely creative, completely artistic, like wanted it, like really wanted it, like wanted it like I did, you know? And when they asked me to join, it was almost like the, uh, uh, the missing piece because their original singer was really good. Andy was amazing, but he couldn't do what I do, you know? And once we did that, it like, the ceiling kind of exploded and there was really nothing that we couldn't do. So about a year later, we got signed, you know, the, a year from the, uh, basically a year from the moment that I joined, we got signed. And this is 98, 99. 98, yeah. We got signed in 98. And then the first album came out in 99. So it was, I mean, we hit the ground hauling ass, you know, you guys the were so, you guys were so different than anything out there. But so right. of that time, we were just having this conversation because of that time is is um, really big at that time is like corn, limp biscuit, massive. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, and it was keep going. We on. took all that shit and just fucking amplified it. You know, we were made up of people 
who we were lo- we were waiting for somebody to make the perfect type of music for us to listen to. And because we couldn't find it in one spot, like we could hear elements, but it wasn't complete. We decided we're like, well, fuck, if nobody's going to do it, then we'll do it ourselves. And that's one of the reasons why our sound is so, um, it's, it's like, it's, it's specific, but it's not, you know, like it has so many different elements from so many different other genres because we were such massive fans of hip hop, hardcore, uh, you know, grindcore, fucking, uh, 80s pop. Like, I mean, we just had so many crazy things going on and ideas that we couldn't contain it in one little thing. And, and it just, just fucking came alive. And so what was the first hint of like, of like, like the first game changer where you're like, oh fuck, this is like, we, I remember for me, it was like, when I got a tour bus, I was like, oh shit. That's a big this, moment. Yeah. That's a big <laughs> moment. I mean, I remember I just, and that was like my first theater tour. I remember the first time I did a theater, I was in Boston and I went, it's crazy because you guys have nine people, but at the time it was me. And I had this weird, surreal moment where I thought, oh, it's just me. I got no one to high five. Like, right? I, you're like I on a bus by yourself. Yeah. I but it's it. rad though, dude. Like you get used to it. And, and we've all done that over the years. Like we've gotten our own buses so we can bring family out and shit. The first, mo- the first time for me, there were three. There were three moments. The, when I felt monetarily stable, that I could pay my bills, that was like a big thing for me. Because like, I was always like, even with all the jobs I worked, man, I was always just like, it was almost like I was trying to keep up and shit. When I realized that I didn't have to worry about the next paycheck, that blew my fucking mind. Like For me, that was, like a, that was a big moment. It was like, oh, wait, I'm doing what I love, and I also don't have to really worry about that you know the there were two moments that really put it put it together for us it was the first time we played london and when we got to england it was dude it was the beatles like it was fucking insane dude they, we played this show at this place called the astoria very famous place it's no longer there anymore which sucks it was such a fucking wonderful shithole is the best fucking place on the planet, you know? Um, and we walked out on stage, dude. And what we didn't realize was that Kerrang! Magazine had been, like, blowing us up, like, the entire time. It was like, fucking, this is, the, this is insane. This is amazing. Slipknot's coming. They're playing this Kerrang! show. And, dude, when we walked out on stage, dude, we got hit by this wall of noise. I mean, it was just like... <laughs> And we were just like, and we're in our masks and shit. And we all stopped and we just went, the, the fuck is going on, dude? Right. And I mean, it was one of the gnarliest, gnarliest shows we've ever played. And to this day, it, even though the place only held, I want to say like maybe 2000 people, I've had at least 50,000 people tell me that they've been at that show because yeah. it, it was one of those, it was like seeing Zeph. Zeppelin at like Royal Albert Hall for a lot of people. It was like a big, big moment. And I can just remember going, dude, something's going on, you know? And then we came home and we played this place in Dallas, which was like this kind of throwaway gig, right? And it was this big, I mean, it looked bigger than it was. It was probably about uh, 3,500 people but it was, it was this place called the Bronco Bowl and, it, and the seats kind of went up. It looked like a little amphitheater, right? And we'd never played anything like that at that yet, you know, up to that point. And when we walked out, dude, the, they were chanting our name and fucking, I, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Like I walked out and it was just this, this little arena of people and it was fucking sold to the nines. People were hanging off the rafters and shit. I was like, okay, this isn't, this has completely exceeded our expectations and we didn't know what to do. And then literally a month later we went gold and then what, like two months later we went platinum and then it just started fucking going crazy. So those were like the, the handful of moments where I realized that something, something different was happening. You know, yeah, you guys, you guys are a unique, a unique experience that like, I want to say like, I mean, I know very little about music and the music business, but you guys got success in the old school format right. where it was record deals, record companies, 
Capitol mm-hmm. Records, sign them, and then into the new school format where it's like, how different is the how different are the two from what your first experience was to where you are today when it comes to making a record or or touring or these three sixty deals or anything? Dude, it's fucking night and day. I mean, we were kind of grandfathered in in the old the old system, you know, mm-hmm. like. Our original deal, and I can talk about this because it's almost up, was uh, seven albums for, I can't even remember what the, what the, the number of years is. Uh, I think it was like 10 years or something like that. And it was in, in our contract, there was like this, there was this clause about the new technology of compact discs. I fucking shit you not. Like, and it, <laughs> and my manager was talking to me about it. He's like, do you realize what they had in your fucking contract? Yeah. I was like, you gotta be shitting me, dude. But now, because I, I think one of the reasons why we've been able to kind of stay ahead of the, the, the crowd and whatever, when it comes to that is because a, our management is amazing. B uh clown has always been our secret weapon, dude. Like, really? He, yeah. He is such a visionary. He looks and he goes off art. He goes off vibe. He goes off. He looks at all of the the new technology and shit. And he chases down all of the stuff that feels exciting to the point where we have never just stagnated in a certain way of getting our art to people, you know? So he has been, I mean, he is, I mean, he really is the, the, the driving force, which is, which makes sense because he started the band. Yeah, well, that, well, that's the that's one of my other themes that I get obsessed with when I want to talk to artists. Is you guys have you guys have put out how many albums has Slipknot put out? Is it this is six right now? We have six then, out, and then our next album, whenever that comes out, that'll be number seven. Iowa was huge, right? But then um, your last one was the biggest one yet, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we had um, like volume three was kind of a game changer for us because it was in a way it was lighter, but it was still heavy. And we were kind of breaking out because we had already covered everything with Iowa. We were like, we're never going to write anything heavier than that. You know, we could try, but we would, it would always sound like we were trying, you know? So it was like, okay, we've done this. Where can we go now? You know? So with every album, we've tried to do that. And the last one was us uh, almost kind of getting back to that mindset because on point five it was very much us just trying to figure out if we wanted to do it anymore because that was the album we did after paul died um after we parted ways with joey we were we, it was kind of fractious you know we we were still kind of going through the motions of you know do we even like playing together you know like it was a it was a it was a nine of you album. guys i mean i can't yeah. imagine yeah. nine fucking opinions dude it's it's like it's like going on stage with a football team man for real yeah. like and it's like having everybody on the same kit but you can't just you can't go to the bench with this band you know like you can't like you know i we have third string guitar player coming in is gonna fucking help us out that no can't do that so it's it was it was a learning thing for us and it's a great album you know and it's got some great moments on it but this last one, We Are Not Your Kind, felt like we were getting back to expanding our boundaries, you know, and, and it, it felt a lot more ambitious. It was a lot more artistic, and yet it was still heavy as fuck. Still had the hooks, still had like all these things that we'd been, you know, trying to incorporate over the years, you know, and, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why like people really fucking caught on to it. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's like... All- the the true testament is can you put out a like can you, I and I always bring it back to comedy is is like your first special is it good that's great your second right. special is that good but then you it's the Bill Burr effect of how do you re reinvent yourself but keep it familiar to your fans right because right. because I, Stanhope once said Doug Stanhope once said I feel like I'm just rewriting uh, for, like abortion jokes right if, if I've done it all I don't know what to do next. Right. And I understand that because I go sometimes in my specials, I go, did I, am I just, or not the, the one that I'm working on now, I go, am I just doing what I did before, but just a little bit different? Like I want to, and, and you're someone distinctly was definitely not afraid to take chances. You right. literally have made albums and written songs that are so, such a huge departure from what 
slip slide knots known as that you right. go, that's fucking, that's different kind of balls, man. That's like Chappelle. Well, yeah, but, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, mean, I, I said long ago that I wasn't, I wasn't going to allow myself to, to kind of get boxed in, you know? And it's, it's easy when you do it right out of the gate. But like when you, when you set your feet and you go, I'm never repeating myself. You know, I may, I may feel familiar sometimes, you know, which is fine because that comes with a certain type of songwriting and stuff, but I'm never going to put something out. That's going to be a regurgitation of what I just did, you know, but this is where musicians have it easier than comedians. And I've had this, this discussion with a lot of comedians is that when somebody comes and sees a musician, they want the hits, Yeah, you know, now if, if, if I go and see a comedian, as much as I would love to see the material that I'd seen before, the majority of the audience is going to be like, seen it, whatever, what's the new shit? So it's yeah. so much harder to be a comedian in my, it, it, I mean, in so many different ways, because it's, you talk about Bill Burr. The great thing about Bill is that not only is his material, does it feel fresh, but it also feels familiar. And he also has his delivery, which is very familiar. You know what I'm saying? So there's, there's those things, uh, the, the little moments that you wait for. It's when, when Chappelle makes himself laugh and he hits his mic on his leg. It's when Bill leans on the, the mic stand and fucking, you know, leans down. It's the little moments like that that you wait for, you know? It's almost like those are the things are like the, the hit songs. So you almost write things yeah. to incorporate those little moments in there, you know? And that, that takes it away from feeling stagnant. And now you're just, you're riffing on things that you love, but you're also giving things that people expect to see, you know? Yeah. Did, was there, was, is there, is there free, is there a freedom in, in wearing a mask when you were Slipknot and then going like, Hey man, I'm going to do a solo album. And I, and I, and this sounds weird, but like, and I'm not Scott Stapp where I am the face of creed right right when, like when scott whenever sky was i know scott and whenever i feel like whenever he does something you go is that's it's creed in a weird way it's creed it's yeah. the voice of creed it's the sound of creed like right even like even eddie vetter i feel like sometimes you're like you know and pearl yeah. jam's got such a distinct sound and, and they but like when he does the ukulele stuff, you're like, oh, the band's just backstage. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. They're just saying, they're just waiting. It's like, when, when's our spot? When do we come in with it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think it's a, a testament to just how distinct my bands are, to be honest. You know, because when I, the stuff that I write with Slipknot has a very distinct feel but they also write such different stuff that, that, than I would, you know? So that keeps it completely different from the other two projects. And honestly, the same way with Stone Sour. With Stone Sour, I have uh, cont contributed a lot more musically over the years, but there's also been a sound and a style that we developed over, over time that is completely different from the CMFT stuff, which to me is a lot more rock and roll. It's a lot more like what I call heritage rock. It's a lot more of my influences. It's punk, it's hardcore, it's 80s rock, it's 70s rock, it's shit like that. Whereas these two are much more modern, you know, almost almost forward thinking. Whereas your know, CMFT is forward thinking, but in a nostalgic way. So once you can differentiate what your sound is going to be, it actually it's actually a lot more fun to lean into that, you know, and, and really fuck go, okay, well, I'm going to write a fucking ACDC tune. I'm going to write a clash tune. I'm going to yeah. fucking put this band up and that band off. Cause I'm a shameful guy who goes, all right, well, I love these bands. So I'm going to write some stuff that feels like that. You know, not, I loved, I loved, I love Corey Taylor's must be stopped. Dude, that, that song. And I've had that for a long fucking time putting that together and then having my boys book and tech on it yeah. was one of my favorite things on the planet. And the fact that it pissed off the elites so much just made me so fucking happy. I cannot tell you. I was just like, Ugh. so good. 
yeah it was it was great that was a really that was like uh i, I started smiling going like this is the point of art of right. do the fucking thing that you think is great that you love and yeah. And I, I, I was so into that. I was so, like down to the wrestling belt. I was like, <laughs> dude, you know what? It's, you know what's so funny about that belt is I'm such an asshole. I had that made before I was even going to use that <laughs> for the album. Because I was going to, for real, in, in my media room, I was going to put a fucking lightsaber up and that belt and just be like, and let people walk in and go, dude, what the fuck? Really? And I'm just like, yep. And then I started looking at it and I was like, that's almost too perfect. I think we're going to have to use this for the album. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Whoop. I love Whoop. Listen, last night I thought to myself, what time do I need to get up tomorrow? 6.30 in the morning. So then I went to my Whoop, my sleep coach. Whoop is the best fitness wearable I've ever worn in my entire life. And it's more than that. It's almost like a fitness coach because I went to sleep knowing I had to work out first in the morning. And I said, Bert, you need to go to sleep at 930 to wake up at 630. So I went to sleep at 930, woke up, had 86 percent sleep effectiveness, then got on the treadmill, hit my strain coach. My strain coach said, based on that sleep, you can work out this much. Look, with where we're at today and trying to work out, Whoop is like having a personal trainer on your list for on your wrist for less than a dollar a day. And it knows so much more about you when you wake up, when you recover, how much exertion you can do, you can put out based on all this is based on how intense your day is. It's going to let you know how to sleep, how much recovery It's the best fitness tracker membership I've ever seen forever for, for, for just $30 a month. You get personalized insights 24 seven that quantify the data to help you better understand your body on a deeper level. And whoop goes beyond just tracking calories and heart rates. It monitors sleep, strain, recovery, all with personalized feedbacks in real time, all within their app. I check it every morning, every morning. It's the big reason I recommend it to anyone who's trying to do maybe a dry January, get in shape this year. It's fantastic. And for all my listeners today, if you're thinking about getting a whoop or giving a whoop, uh, this is their best deal out, out there. And you got to try it out. See if it's for you. Get your first month of whoop for free. When you sign up for their six-month membership, go over to whoop.com slash BurtCast to get started for $0 today. Join Whoop today. Sleep better, recover faster, train smarter this season and beyond. This podcast is brought to you by Fiverr. Look, the way we worked seemingly changed overnight. And if there's one thing we've learned is businesses need to learn to adapt and have the right resources. That is essential. And it's crucial, especially with me trying to maintain a digital presence. That's why I love Fiverr. Fiverr is a global network of online, online, on-demand, freelance talent here to help. Whether you're launching your first business or scaling your current business down or your need of extra support, to just finish up a project, or you want to try digitalizing, digitally optimizing your business, you can find what you're looking for instantly and easy. Customize your searches by service, deadline, price, seller reviews, and more. No more guessing the game. No more guessing in the game. You know exactly what you're paying for upfront. No negotiated needed, and the price is always project based, not hourly. Twenty four seven customer service. Reach out with questions anytime, anywhere. And they have a network of quality talent you can count on. This time, it's difficult for all of us right now. Freelancers have worked with some of the most influential brands in the world. Find the freelancers that are ready when you are. Fiverr's platform is flexible enough to accommodate and manage the ebb and flow of your business in flux. Check out Fiverr.com and receive 10% off your first order by using my promo code, BERTCAST. Find all the digital services you'll need in one place at F-I-V-E-R-R dot com. Use the promo code BERTCAST. Again, that's Fiverr.com, and the code is BERTCAST. When did you know you wanted to be a musician? Uh, I mean, there were a couple different moments in my life where I knew I wanted to like be into music. I, I always loved music. Yeah, It wasn't until I was about 10 that I realized I had a gift for it. And then it wasn't until I was 13 that I really started kind of like playing with people, like little teenage bands and shit. When I was 19, I, uh, that's when I really was like, I'm going to do this full, t- full time. Yeah. I, I wonder, I, I keep thinking, you know, so many people think of the journey of like, of like a, a rock star as a, yeah. uh, as you you have a you grew up a certain way, you had certain obstacles, you had 
hurdles that pr- are presented to, I seem sometimes to rock stars only, right. um, drugs and alcohol, lifestyle, and then, and they go, it's a good thing he started a band. As opposed when you said, it wasn't until I was you know 10 that I realized I had a calling for it. Right. And I was like, I, I wonder how many people start bands going without the calling whatsoever. <laughs> right, right. Like, I, just want, I just want to be a rock star. It's, it's weird because I was almost the antithesis of why a lot of people start bands. Like everybody I talked to was like, they got into it for the parties and the chicks and whatnot. I started a band just for that. Right, exactly. I was the absolute opposite. I started a band specifically to write songs and get them out of my head. Like that was the whole reason because I could get chicks and party on my own. It was like, I don't need a fucking band for that. You know, like I was, you know, about 50 pounds ago when I was 19, I was fucking, you know, pretty hot. I could, you know, I could tear it up. I was tearing it up, dude. So I put the, I put my first band together specifically to, to write songs because it, it was so much fun to me, you know? And I had, I learned how to play guitar specifically to do that. And it was, it was the best. It was the best fucking like four years of my life was just playing bars and doing a balance of like covers and originals and just having a fucking blast, dude. Is there, is there somewhat of a, a I always say, uh, by the way, the, I say this too much, but I, I say there's like, I get a survivor's remorse having succeeded or gotten past the hurdle of being able to get to the place where you are fortunate right. enough to do theaters. Yeah. But then I, I really connect as an artist is the guy in the clubs. Like that's being at the Des Moines Funny Bone. That's who I am at forever. That's who I'll always be. Right. And w- do you look at bands when people are coming up or do you look at your friends who started bands and go, how, did, how come that's not me? How come I didn't? How come, why did I succeed? And right. how come he didn't, you know? I mean, it's maybe early on, but we also spent a lot of time trying to help our bands, our, our friends out. Like we got a lot of our friends, like development deals. We took them out on the road with us. Yes. Yeah. Um, to this day, I mean, my my CMFT band is made up of people who I've jammed with for some of these guys going on 17 years. You know, like uh, my best friend Jason plays bass. Uh, my buddy Dustin plays drums, and I took his band Walls of Jericho out a million times, and he and I have done stuff in the in the in the past. And then Zach and Tooch, I mean, Tooch was, uh, ended up in Stone Sour for a while, but I've known him for another 15 years and same with Zach. So these are dudes who I knew were working and doing it, whether I was going to do a band or not, they were working and doing it. But I also knew that I wanted them with me as not only as players, but as friends. So I always, I don't know. It's, it's one, it's, it's, it's almost like. It's almost fe- like feeling like you have to apologize for being funny. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's something that appeals to people about me, you know? And mm-hmm. I've wondered that over the years. Is there something about my voice or is there something about. Yeah, like it's so, that- it's so, a lot, of, a lot of guys can sing, but for whatever reason, when you do it, it's different. Yeah. And, and I don't know why. And I, know, I don't know if it's just people feel it more or whatnot. I mean, it's something I'm definitely very grateful for, you know, and it's also pushing. And you, and you can't, and you can't, you don't have the, like when, not, not to shit on Sebastian Bach, but when Sebast- Sebastian Bach can fucking sing, but he also was beautiful, like a woman. Right. So, yeah. Dude, you're like one of my heroes, man. You know, oh, like I got, I was Sebastian three Bach. Skid Row albums are amazing and I'll fight people on it. Fucking for real. Like, uh, but at the same time, the thing about Sebastian when he first started was he also had that crew writing the music as well, man. And those five dudes were so good. I mean, you could hear the way that that Snake and uh, and uh, Scotty, the way their guitars blended together, the way Rachel could put bass lines together and write lyrics the way Rob played drums, there was something, it's, it's just like the original five Guns N' Roses guys. There was something so special yeah. about that chemistry, man, you know, that we forget sometimes that Sebastian was just the icing on the cake for that, you know? He was the perfect voice for that music. And that's why those albums are still fucking so righteous, man. Dude, uh, I when I was in Russia, I would play 
that song. Woke up to the sound of poor. Oh yeah, I remember you. It's yeah. just a G and a C. I yeah. would play it, and you know, you do a little little pick at the end and a little pick at the beginning, right. and I'd play it for the Russian mob, and they were they were just like, "This is fucking great." But they thought I wrote it because they had never heard <laughs> they never heard any of the fucking music over right. there. So they're like, "This guy's fucking amazing." Right. And they didn't understand the lyrics. Had they th- had I been able to slide lyrics into them, they would have been like. Dude, you should start a band. Uh, uh, right. Yeah, totally. It's like, you fucking, we're going to get you signed. We're going to handle all this shit for you. <laughs> I, and then I explained to them, I can only tour Russia, okay? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, we can't go as, maybe the Ukraine. We'll touch on the Ukraine, but nothing, nothing outside this curtain. It's like that movie <laughs> yesterday. With, with, did you see that movie? Yeah, man. I thought that was such a novel idea. You know, but it also speaks to the power of those songs, too, because, oh, I mean, it's crazy. Right. I'm not one of these like the new Beatles haters, which I think is absolutely yeah. fucking horseshit. It's just like, get over yourself. It's yeah. one of the reasons why all these like this younger generation is trying to rip off older bands, but not give them the credit because they want their generation's Zeppelin or their generation's fucking, you know, Lincoln Park. It's just like, go oh, fuck yourself. Can't yeah. Stop. I, I'm a sucker for any. I'm a sucker for any. First of all, time travel movie, uh, parallel universe movie. Right. I I I have a I have a very hard time with horror movies. I cannot. Really? They scare the living fuck out of me. Like like scare me in a way where I go. I'm not enjoying this. Like this <laughs> is, this is not fun for me. And 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 there is and there is a part of that. Like some of the Slipknot masks genuinely scare. Right. Like genuinely, I go. I go, hey man, that's whatever brain ha- thought that up is. Yeah, so wait, yeah. I want to talk about horror movies with you because you love horror movies. Oh fuck yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what is it about a horror movie that is like a warm blanket for you that that you go like, this is what I'm talking about? I, you know, I think it's because I, it's the same reason why I love like like really good heavy music. You know, it's just there's something about it that triggers something that I just, this fascinates me, man. I mean, you got to understand, I'm not a massive fan of like super gore, you know? I also define, love- define, define what a good horror movie is for you. Uh, I mean, obviously the original Halloween is almost a perfect horror movie to me. You know, it's, it builds the suspense. The whole last act is just fucking chaos, you know? And you're like, at, at some point, you're just like, where the fuck is he now? Where, gee, where, God damn it, what the yeah. hell? You know, like, that to me is, it's perfect. And if you notice, there's very little blood. There is no real gore. They didn't really get into that until Halloween 2. Um, it's really suspenseful. It's, honestly, it's, it's very Hitchcockian, man, where you never know where the threat's going to come from. It's also shot so fucking cool. Like that scene where she leans against the, the doorstop and he comes out of the darkness <laughs> to this day. I'm like, ah! it fucks with me so hard, dude, that, and I, and I know it's going to happen every time. And it's just the way the light just reveals his mask and it picks that up. And then he just comes in the foreground to ah. the first time I saw it, it scared the fuck out of me. And I just love that feeling though. I just love, because here's the thing. There's so much in the real world to be scared of these days that if if I can watch something and be scared, but know that I'm going to be okay, it's a different type of scare. You know what I'm saying? It's a different type of of stress that you can go (gasps) and then and then you're you're just you're okay. It's like because, you know, it's not happening to you, you know. That's interesting. I used to say, I used to say when I got on planes and I was drinking, I was like, I'm probably killing myself by drinking on this plane, but at least I'm killing myself tomorrow, not today. Right. <laughs> at least today I'm like, I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make it because I know I'm killing myself tomorrow. Right, right, right. We're just putting, we're just, we'll cash that check in the next couple of weeks. So what, what are your, what are your top five favorite horror movie, horror movies? Oh, fuck. Uh, well, obviously Halloween, the original. Um, the thing, John Carpenter's The Thing is amazing, dude. Yeah. Uh, from Dust Till Dawn, because it is just an absolute fucking gonzo punk fucking horror movie. It's insane. Um, the Lost Boys, 
<sighs> dude, so good, right? I dude. mean, super underrated too. Like people forget that that's a horror movie, and then oh, yeah. it's so fucking cool, you know. Um, and then uh, Aliens, the second, the, the second one, because I love the first one, but Aliens is so much like extra and more that, and you can watch that as an action movie. It doesn't have to be a horror movie. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. it, I love movies that you can watch from a certain point of view in different head spaces, you know, like fucking like from Dustal Dawn. If you, if you took out a lot of the kills, that's a comedy for fuck's sake. Like that's a road movie, you know, but there's so many great horror moments and so many different textures in it that it's just, it, it keeps me coming back going, fuck, that's a, that's a great performance. The way that was shot looks great. The fact that the blood is green instead of red, you for, it, it takes you out of that gore fest, you know? Yeah. Do, try to explain to me, this is, by the way, this is a broad thought that I'm asking you to define. So like, so like there seems to be a love with so many rock bands with horror movies. Right. And then the softer the music, the less it seems like they like horror movies. Does that right. make sense? <laughs> All right. Okay. Like, Fair enough. So what is the musicality? What is the chord structure or the, the type of playing where you go, as soon as you start playing a straight up uh, this, you're no longer in the horror, horror genre of Rob Zombie, you right. guys, Marilyn Manson. Like, like what, what is the musicality in that that separates the two, do you think? I mean, like, that's a good question, man. I, I think it's, uh, you go from, fuck, you go from a hard R to PG-13 like really like really quick you know which is weird because pg-13 used to be a lot scarier yeah when we were kids dude fucking gnarly um i would say it's the difference between you know doc and putting something in dream warriors and john bon jovi putting something in young guns too you know like there's that little wash in the middle you know <laughs> where you're just like yeah, you can tell know. by the jeans they're wearing on stage if they're going to be into <laughs> right totally and that's not shit on him it's just like okay okay we get it but you were also in sex in the city we're not going to let you forget that all right just saying <laughs> oh that's so great what is that like I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh the uh, like i'm a big fan of blind melon right like i love right, right. I interesting love blind melon and it, and i feel like when you say that to people, they go, oh, the uh, bu Bumblebee Girl? And you're like, actually, oh, there's so much more than that. There's so much more than that. Yeah. What are some bands that you're a fan of that you go, like, I know that you're a fan of Faith No More. Yeah. And I, f I feel like Faith No More is one of the most underrated bands in the world. Absolutely. To, not to, like, people who know music, but to people who just, the passerbys, like my wife. That right. fucking epic is, I mean, epic. I mean, really, yeah. genuinely is epic. Yeah, that I mean that band, and I I mean I go back like Chuck Mosley years. Love them, you know. Yeah. Like the Faith No More to me, and it, as much as I love Mike, the, the the rest of the band really gets overlooked just by how creative, how good they were and still are, man. Yeah. Um, I, God, you know, there's so many bands to me that had had a had a hand in kind of creating who I am, you know? And Faith No More was definitely the band that kind of opened my mind to the fact that you can do anything. You know, unless you lock yourself in a genre, you can fucking do anything. Who cares what anybody, you know, who cares what anybody thinks, you know? Who cares what anybody thinks? And I'll be, I mean, I'm probably one of those people who loves Angel Dust more than uh, the real thing because like angel dust was taking it in a, such another direction. I mean, it's, I mean, midlife crisis is probably one of the most perfect, like pop heavy tunes ever written because it, it just, it's such a fucking journey. And that song just keeps building and building and it's, it's amazing. So good. Yeah. I, I love that. I had a summer where I just listened to faith no more, but it was, it was at a party. You always, you always get like that one friend that can appreciate music better than you. Right. And, and just, and goes, Oh, you're not listening to it. Right. And you're like, what? And you're like, Oh, you gotta listen to like, for me, 
on Blind Melons, my my buddy was like, "You gotta listen to Changes," and I was like, "Is right. what's that?" He's like, "You just listen to the one fucking hit, and then you didn't listen to the rest of it." Right, right. And not, that is the majority of 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 fun, that's the majority of music listeners, but not the majority of Slipknot fans. No, like, no. I mean, there's there's yeah. I mean, it's very rare that you find a casual Slipknot. Fan. <laughs> you do not find a casual slip. Like if you guys are the only band, I, one of the only bands, I feel like. I feel like this is going to sound crazy. What am I right. about to say? You guys are like in the same way that widespread panic and fish could play any song off of any of their albums and their fans will lose their minds. Right. You could play any number of songs off any of your albums. Does not matter. And they'd be probably more excited going, they never play this. Right. Yeah. And that's, you're absolutely right. Like it's, and it's, and I absolutely get your analogy to be honest, because it's like, it's like a dead show in yeah. a way. You know, where they'll, they'll dust, you know, they'll dust off some fucking crazy shit from, you know, like 66. And people are like, oh, my God, they haven't played that since 1973 when they're in a fucking like just weird, weird, nerdy shit. You know, we um for the longest time, we had, had never played Metabolic, the song, uh, which is probably one of the heavier fucking songs off Iowa. And the fans would just beat us up. This is like one more tour. You never fucking played Metallica like Metabolic. We've been, we've been asking for ten years, you know. So we threw it on the set on the point five uh, tour cycle, and people lost their fucking minds, right? But we had also taken out Wait and Bleed, which was a bold move. I mean, because at this point we have so many songs. Yeah. That you have so many like, songs on YouTube that are just right. over it's so many songs that are over a hundred million views, and you're like, I mean, it's just like insane. Yeah, it's crazy, dude. But here's the thing: we were playing metabolic, which people have been beating us up for for 20 years, right? And because we didn't wait, we didn't play wait and bleed, we had people ripping us to shreds. So like, I waited the whole fucking show for wait and bleed. You didn't fucking play. I'm like. It's like, uh, did you not, did you miss the <laughs> fact that we've been, we've played that song for 16 fucking years every time we come around your fucking house. And then we, we also, we gave you duality. We gave you psychosocial. We gave you spit it out. We also gave you fucking metabolic, which we never play. And, but people shred us, dude. So it's so, it's so weird. Our fans are so fucking weird. They will never be happy until we play all six albums from top to bottom in one show and just, destroy me you know what's, like, your, what's your what's your what's your limit on songs that you can play in a show and maintain your voice it's different with each band um with the cmft thing man i'm doing a fuck when we did uh live at the forum we did 24 songs and i mean it was like don't two hour fucking show um but on a tour man you have to scale it back you know just to keep because i could do about three days in a row with and then have a day off and keep it pretty, pretty strong, you know, um, with Slipknot, I think the most I've done is 18 songs, which is fucking a lot. A you lot know? of songs. I mean, luckily, dude, that's, yeah, that's, that's like three albums worth of shit, dude. You're killing yourself. But, uh, most festivals that they, they limit your set time anyway. So we kind of pare it back. So when you're doing a, a big festival run, you're doing, you know, 12, 13 songs, which is nothing, you know, that's that you know, fucking you blink and it's done. Um, but then when you're doing your own shows, you know, you always throw a little more extra in there, you know, for fans who are, you know, going out of their way and shit. Uh, Stone Sour, the most I ever did was 20. Um, and that's kind of saying something because some of those notes are motherfuckers, man, like having to hit that shit. And then all those songs that I wrote in Stone Sour, I'm playing with fucking, you know, CMFT. So it's it's a good balance, man. Like knowing that it was just a one off. I was like, oh, yeah, we're just going to load this motherfucker up with like a ton of hits, you know. But if I if I go on the road with CMFT, whenever that fucking happens, um, it'll probably I'll probably keep it around like 18 to 20. You know, with a cool, but I also want to go out on the road with like 50 tunes. So every night is different, you know, like that's my ultimate goal. It's like, I want to do a Springsteen run where every show is a thumbprint, man. You know, it's just like, I was there 
when they fucking did this song and did this song, they'd never fucking done it before. Like that's my ultimate goal, basically. That's my that's my out game. <laughs> I saw Springsteen. I saw Springsteen at the, I guess maybe at this, I don't know, at the forum maybe. I forget where I saw him, but I mean, it was it was it was down on U down down in USC, and it was like two and a half hours. Yeah, easily. He's a fucking he was, maniac, dude. <laughs> and he and I and I I found that recently I found that if I do, if I do, because I always what I do is I'm in a, in a weird pr, pr, uh in a weird spot because if I don't tell the machine, I get uh, people give me shit. So I I do an hour of new material. And then at the end, I'll tell whatever stories they want to hear at the end. Right. But I found that I used to do like hour 30 and I would lose my voice immediately. And I found that if I do just around an hour, 10 an hour, 15, my voice can last so much longer. Right. Right. Like throughout a tour. Yeah. And it's, you always, my only problem is when I get sick, I have to, I mean, and it's a bitch, man. And I, I, yeah. I'm, I always get sick because I have fucking sinus problems. And even that, even though I quit smoking like six years ago, like I still have like gnarly sinus problems every winter I get fucking sick. So I'm constantly, I know in the middle of a tour, I'm going to get sick, like right in this area. So I prepare for it, you know, like I know I've, I've developed like six or seven ways to kind of get through a, a show just by being sick, you know, just because I have to, you know, I, I can get through a set. I can get through, through a set without my voice. Oddly. Yeah. Enough. I mean, it's, it's crazy, man. Like you, and you have to know you knowing your body is so key to getting through a show like that. So, and I did, I did, um, when I, when my, when I did my first book, I did a, a massive book tour, uh, where I was doing like, you know, I was talking for about an hour before I, and then I would play for like two hours, just acoustic. You know, so I know the pain that you were th- going through, just like trying to pace yourself, like trying not to overdo it and shit. I and mean, it's crazy, man. Like you have to, you you have to really know where you're at. You, and especially when you're, you're hitting certain notes in your, in your jokes and your bits. Oh yeah. Dude, it's, if you don't do it right, it's it, to me, it's like not hitting that note in the song every night. You know, like it's, there's a certain mental fuck that comes with that where you're just like, oh God. So it's mental. Yeah. And um, alcohol for me is my, is fucks my voice up really right. bad. Yeah. And I have a, I have a joke about dolphins and I used to be able to do the <laughs> Right. Bro, right. If I, if I have been partying and it's like eight shows into the tour, like right. we did a tour that was like, I think 23 cities. And I think it was 23 nights and maybe like maybe eight, 18 cities, something like that. Right. Towards the end, I, I just was like, and then the dolphin was like, eh. ah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dude. And you're just like, right. <laughs> yeah. Right guys. You know, like a dolphin sound, <laughs> like, oh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. No, I kind of want to go into a, I want to go into a medically induced coma and just let my body recover. Because I cannot allow it to recover. It just will not recover. The biggest thing I learned was eight hours of vocal rest will will save your life. And it's usually, and it doesn't have to be, it it doesn't have to be anything other than just getting a solid eight hours of sleep. You know, like you get get eight hours of sleep. What I do now is about two hours before I go to bed, I just shut up. So I get an extra two and then I don't do press. I don't usually start press now until about noon. Um, so I get an extra. Say that because I said, to, I, I actually said to my representations one time, I was like, I was like, I, I don't think you guys understand. I'm talking all day. Right. Like I, like I get up and I, I'm doing press from the bus all day. I'm doing podcasts. I'm doing this. And then I'm going and doing that. And then I'm like, by the end of, at the end of the day, I don't want to talk anymore. It's really interesting. I think for the average person who just goes, bro, I take your job in a heartbeat. You right. know, you go, you go, yeah, but there is a, it, it. There's actually an emotional toll that comes with talking this much, like because I feel like I, I really get sick of myself. <laughs> right, right, dude. It's it is so exhausting having to people all the fucking time, dude. I was just talking to my wife about this because she and I, I mean, she's an entertainer too, and she does uh, virtual meet and greets, and it's like the first 
hour, it's fucking great, you know? And then by the time you hit that second hour, just you're just you're starting to hit it. And then for me, you get into the third hour, and I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm cross-eyed. It's you get done and you're just like, I don't want to talk to anyone. I have kids, I don't want to fucking talk to you. I don't want to talk to my wife. I don't want to talk to my band. Fucking no, I'm 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 ignoring phone calls. Like I I just want to fucking sit and just <laughs> just like golem the fuck out of the place. Dude, we do we do radio tours like well, like if you're if like when that when my show came out on Netflix or my special comes out, I do these radio tours that it's you know call in call in for 15 minutes to like and i'll have starting at six until like 10 i don't know if you guys ever do those oh yeah yeah you're, you're those, talking about, yeah you're talking to a pro i do, yeah, those I do it fuck all me up. yeah they fuck me up for like a day like yeah. i i've often taken a xanax at my last hour and been like i'm going to sleep after this and i'm not talking to a fucking soul <laughs> Uh, I, I just i'm fucking i i'm done by that time people don't understand man like especially for us you know we're constantly doing it and it's a different energy from just hanging out yeah it's totally different energy from just hanging out because when you're when you're just hanging there's that there's no pressure to be a certain way and when you're an entertainer, there's constant fucking pressure to be a certain goddamn way. You know, whether you're you're just being yourself or not, there's a certain amount of energy that goes into engaging people and also trying to get that point across that you want people to come and see the fucking thing that you're going to do, man. It's incredibly fucking it, it's 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 exhausting. It's the beauty of your of Slipknot is that but which you probably didn't appreciate at the time, I'm guessing, because I know how I know I just know human nature is you had the opportunity to go into a huge festival, play in mass, go back, take the mask off, and then go watch a show in the audience in a great spot and people didn't bother you. Yeah. But I'm sure yeah. at that age, you're probably like, hey, man, I wouldn't mind uh, people knowing who I was a little bit. It was, I, I, the, the first couple of years was rad, you know? Yeah. Um, and, but then we, uh, the, the more success we got, yeah, obviously it's human nature, man. You just, the ego starts to come out. We're just like, well, I want to fucking, you know? And, and it was, uh, it, as much as people think it was the reason that I start, I put stone sour back together. It's not, it's for me, that was about writing music again. Cause I just <laughs> wasn't being able to write music and slip not. Cause I'm just not that good. I'm not as good as those guys are at like intricate, like riffs and shit. I've gotten better. But at the time, I, I wasn't getting to write music. And I just felt unfulfilled, you know? So I put that back together. But the byproduct of that was now all of a sudden people know who I look like, you know? And it, probably, not to say this in a, in a beefy way, but you're, you're, I think you're probably the face of Slipknot. Yeah. I mean, for the, for the most part. Um, I know I know diehard Slipknot fans are going to be like, hold on. like, But I'm like... You're the one, like when people say Corey Taylor, everyone goes, "Oh, oh my God, fuck Corey Taylor!" Like, yeah, um, and and I think most guys, most guys, and and I think both of us can appreciate this now, but it must be beautiful to to have all the success and all the trappings, and then be able to dip into a grocery store and everyone be like, "Oh, absolutely, dude!" You know? I, I I was just seriously saying this exact same thing to somebody, where it's like I get the benefits of fame without the the tmz shit i don't get any of that shit because i mean i you know i i get to play in front of fucking thousands and millions of people i get to write carte blanche i get to cool cool shit like this and i can still chill at home like nobody's camping outside my fucking house uh, all my kids are taken care of my bills are paid like i have no fuck i have no fucking like worries i i love it it's the it's the best it did how was that when you decided to put stone sour back together and go out on the road. Was that, a, is that like a conversation that you had to have, do you guys have group meetings or chapter meetings for, for, for Slipknot? We, did, we didn't at first, uh, but then as the contention started to kind of rise, we, we made a priority of kind of getting us all together and, and, and having like, like band meetings and shit. And it was great, man. We, we, even when the stress was there and the tension and whatnot, it was able for, it was, it was good for us to kind of, just kind of get shit off our chest because we're, you know, we're Midwest boys, you know, like we'd rather talk about it than fucking have managers and shit come in. Even if it was 
was it, it was tough, you know. But it was it was good for us to kind of get on the same page, air some grievances, and then we could reconnect, you know. And uh, we uh, when when Stone when I put Stone Sour back together, I wasn't the only one uh, doing a, a side project. Um, Joey was doing Murder Dolls. Clown was doing uh, something that was called The Orange, but then became, to my surprise, like different people had different things going on. You know, Sid was still doing his DJ stuff. So it wasn't like, you know, we were getting too far off the reservation without being, uh, you know, w- without turning our back on. Yeah. Stuff, which, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it, you know, it, to me, that's, that's the motherboard, you know, nothing's ever going to fucking replace that. So um i look at i look at you in your bands and your music and your projects as i do with my podcasts like right. i go i have three podcasts i have bill burt i have two bears one cave and i have right. Burtcast. and right the only one i can guarantee is going to show up every day is Burtcast because i'm it it's just me right. me and halston right. by the way i've got to i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna i gotta include halston in this at some point he lost his fucking shit he's a musician he's my oh really he's my my pot my, my producer and right. he is a huge Slipknot fan, like oh, fucking huge, cool, man. Huge, a huge Corey Taylor fan. More oh. importantly, um, but so I got to bring him in in a second, but not yet, Halston, not yet. So, uh, <laughs> what, 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 what places can you guys can Slipknot not play? Because, like, are there, are there, like, I, I just assume that if you guys go to Iran, they're like, whoa, we don't like the occult here or something, you know? Right. right. We've been banned from a handful of places. Um, I'm fairly certain we'll we'll never play China. Um, <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, I think they would fucking you'd go bananas. Oh no, crazy. they they the fans would love us, but the the, the government they don't want anything to do with us. Um, we've actually tried to book shows there, and and they've they've shut it down. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. Um, we were banned in Ireland for a while. Um. Yeah, uh, because we Happy were saying, uh, well, I mean, it's, I, I don't even know why. It's like, for some reason, people just thought we were satanic for like the longest time, probably because of the heretic song. But yeah. if people really knew, they'd know it wasn't about religion at all. You know, it's not about Satan. It's just we're using that as a metaphor. Yeah. Um, we were banned in uh, Athens, Greece, uh, because because they that they thought we were fucking satanic. I mean. It is funny. I mean, a lot of those bands uh, have have been lifted, uh, but the Chinese one is like, no, no, it's not. I bet never going to happen. I bet you guys are fucking huge in Finland. Massive, yeah. Like, dude, we. But here's the thing: the that whole Northern Europe, that Scandinavian era, was hard for us to crack at first. Really, because there was a certain stigma stigma about Slipknot uh, for the longest time. We were still lumped in with with new metal for the most part, you know, really largely because of the time frame when we came out. What was Even new, though, metal, new metal? New metal is is corn, it's uh Limp Biscuit, uh like a handful of other bands. For the longest time, nobody wanted anything to do with new metal. And because of black metal and like progressive, like what they call uh uh not speed metal, but power metal. That was massive up there. And because people looked at new metal as like lower, yeah. we, we didn't get any love up there for like the longest time. It, it, it took us getting up there and playing in front of people and showing them what we were that, yeah. that they, they really started to, to respond to it, you know? But it was like um, it, the, a perfect example is for the longest time, people looked at new metal as people from the grunge area era looked at 80s hair metal. It was the same kind of vibe, you know? Oh, interesting. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and which is weird because there's so much fucking good music in that new metal era. And people forget how fucking massive Korn was. I mean, at, at one point, Korn was bigger than we were. I mean, just, they were the end all fucking be all. It was insane, you know? So I I think it's because that bubble burst and kind of collapsed on itself. And, uh, and because that, that era, that area is, uh, they're just a little more for lack of a better term, snobbish when it comes to music, you know? 
Um, if it's not Norwegian black metal, a lot of time they don't really want to hear about it, you know? So for us to be able to crack that, 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 uh, that territory was actually pretty massive. Well, there was, and there was a weird thing about rock stars who had nice cars versus rock stars who, uh, just, you didn't, you couldn't imagine in a nice car. I remember that way with comedy. I remember asking, um, Bobcat Goldthwaite, like what kind of car he had. And he was. And he stopped and he was like, why are you asking me that? And I go, I don't know, you, you don't seem like a guy who would have a nice car. Even though you have money, I don't see, you don't seem like a guy who would, it would, that would matter to. Right. And he goes, he's like, hey, he goes, I just got rid of my good, I had a great, he had an old like Cadillac convertible or something. And he goes, oh, wow. and broken down and I just bought a brand new Mercedes and I'm having a hard time being a guy that owns a Mercedes. Right. And I was like, that's so interesting. And Corn and Limp Biscuit were bands that, were very comfortable in success. Like, right. like it was like, you know, nice cars and nice things and, and shiny outfits. And, 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 and as opposed to what grunge was before that, and I'm sure what they held, you know, that death metal to black metal to was like, right. they were, I'd, I'd like to think that that whole new metal wave was so important to that next wave of American heavy metal, to be honest. Like, oh, 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 it, it was, you know by the saying? way, it was so, I mean, to this day, if I'm going to jog, it's got to be something from the, from 98, 99, 2000. Yeah. I, I, that's what makes me run. And, and I'm, I'll say this unabashedly. I am a huge fucking Limp Bizkit fan. I'm a huge Fred Durst fan. Yeah. Like I have a good Fred Durst story. I met, I, I know him now. So like I've texted him with him stuff. But one time, one time, I think I told him this, I was in the Gelson's, he lives near me and, uh, we were, okay. and I was at the Gelson's and I saw him, it's early in the morning, like we're one of the maybe 10 people in Gelson's and right. I see him and I'm like, okay, all right. I can't hold myself back from when I recognize someone, I'm going to say fucking hi to them. I, right, right. My whole life. <laughs> so I go, I'm going to, I'm going to, I see he's in here. I'm going to make sure that I, I'm going to time it out. Right. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to say. I'm going to just do it real quick and passing, and then maybe we'll stop and we'll talk. Right. And uh, so I start, <laughs> I see him, and I start making my way to him. And I'm like, all right, here we go. I'm going to say something in three, two. And he looks at me, and he goes, don't do it, and just kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I, I think I ended up telling him that. But it was the best, it was the best, like, Man, don't I know what right. you want to do? Right. It's not going to turn out the way you want it to turn right. out. Right, right. I appreciate that you like my music. Just let me get my groceries, man. <laughs> so I've been for a long time, I know that look on that face. Right. Oh, and we can pick it up too. Like we see it, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you see it now. You know, with oh, like I can see, and, I can yeah. see when I. It's it's interesting. I can see when like we were. I was playing golf with my dad. and he was saying something about the group in front of us, and I go, I was like, I. I would say they were playing slow and he's like, I'm going to say something. I said, don't. And he said, why? I said, they're fans. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm just looking at them. Right. I can tell they, I can tell they listen to the podcast. Right. I'm certain they listen to Rogan. I'm almost certain they listen to two bears, one cave, or they've seen my special. Right. And he goes, buddy, you realize how arrogant that sounds? And I said, nah, you just get to a place where you know, yeah, as man. I said that, as I said that the guy goes, the machine. And I was like, what's up, buddy? Yeah. And they were like, dude, I can't believe you're playing behind us. And I was like, yeah, my dad goes, how the fuck can you see that? And I go, you just, it's like you do enough meet and greets, you do enough of your shows and you kind of get a profile of what your fan's going to look like. And, and it's, and, and I, I know Rogan can do it. I've seen Rogan do it right. where he's like, where he's like, come on, well, I, we can't stick around here. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's, you start to read like, especially uh, body, like body language. Like the second, and I've, this is the move for the, this is the one I've really started to pick up on. I get this one and then it's a second and then the eyes go up a little bit and then they turn away and I'm like, we're going to have to move in about five seconds. Yeah. <laughs> we fucking just, and it's, and it's, it's, it's rad, you know, it's cool. And I, I try to be as accommodating as, as I can to people, you know, but when it's like, like me and my wife, I have a hard time going to shows now. Like, oh yeah. Oh, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just, you never, unless it's somebody I know and I know I can like sit in a place and watch the show. 
it's you're you'll never see the full show ever like for the rest of your life it's it's that it's that gnarly this podcast is brought to you by skylight look if you are looking for a christmas gift look no further skylight is the gift to give your family your friends your parents we are all far apart we are going to stay far apart especially in california one of the greatest ways to stay connected is this these skylight frames i'm telling you we got one for all our friends, the all we call the campers, all four of them. We got all of them. And then we post all our pictures from our trips on those. And they're all shared. So we all have these screens that are like, a, it's a beautiful picture frame. It sits in our kitchen and they're all connected. And the same pictures show up. Or you can send it just to yourself. It is a frame that you can update anywhere instantly from email. It's a great way to get close to those you love when you're separated. It's set up is super easy. 60 seconds. That's it. Everyone in the family then emails all them, all their personal things to their personal skylight email address, and they pop up in seconds. Multiple people can send photos of to the frame. And it's a great way for a large group of network friends to stay in touch. It has a black and white mat. Uh, it's super, it's it looks like a, it's beautiful. It's, it doesn't look like it looks like it belongs in your home. They have a 10 inch touch screen. So like when I see a picture of the girls back when I hadn't gotten their teeth fixed and I miss them, I miss those days a lot. I will always swipe back and check it. I'm telling you, we got one for my sisters, my dad, my mom, my, my sisters, but they live in two houses and then my parents live together. But that right now, anyway, my point is we all have a network. Our friends have a network. It's fun. It's a great way, especially when I post, I posted a picture of wood to the, our friends one. That was a fun one. Anyway, right now, as a special offer, you can get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter the code BERT. That's right. You get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame. Just go to skylightframe.com and enter the code BERT. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com and use the promo code BERT. This podcast is brought to you by DHM Detox. Let me tell you something. These little bad boys are your drinking buddy this December. They, I ran out and I had them send me more and they are awesome. All you do is take one little, oh, this is their hydration system. Hold on one second. Oh, their hydration system's awesome too. Let me explain, let me talk to you about DHM Detox first. I'm sorry, I just got this. I ran out, we use these so much on the tour, so much that it, that we literally ran out. All you gotta do, two of these right here with your first drink. Take two of these with your first drink and boom, you are in business, buddy. The next day, you feel fantastic. No more of those Sunday, sun, Sunday, Mondays, you know? You take two of these with your first drink, and if you're going to party a little extra, throw another two into the mix. But for me, here's what I love. This Christmas season, we're doing a lot of Zoom uh, parties. And when you do a Zoom party, you want to have a drink with everyone. You want to be cordial, but you don't want to go overdo it. Uh, that's what I would do. We open a bottle of wine. Leanne and I each have a couple glasses. She has one, I have two, maybe three. And then you're done for the night, right? You're not going to tie one on. You're not going to get wasted. You just take, bam, two of these at the with your first drink, and you are set on tour. We would take one when we started, and we'd throw one in our pocket just in case we didn't know how the night was going. And what's great is the next morning, they now have these hydration replenishers, which pairs perfectly with the DHM Detox. No Days Wasted is offered a risk-free purchase. So if you don't love it, they're going to refund you on your first box. We've got you taken care of. 20% off on your first order and free shipping in the U.S. Just, just head over to nodayswasted.co slash BERT. Use the promo code BERT at checkout. That is nodayswasted.co slash BERT. Trust me. I'm telling you right now. I said no drinking in December, but I don't think I have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> nodayswasted.co slash BERT. Use BERT at checkout for... 20% off your first order plus free shipping in the U.S. Just head over to nodayswasted.co slash Bert. Use the promo code Bert. Uh, my problem is, and, and Bert, Bill Byrne, I went to a, a, a XFL football game, and he goes, he goes, stop matching their energy. He was like, they recognize you, and then you get more excited that they recognized you. <laughs> and they got, he goes, because you're taking it to the next level. Like, it doesn't need to go there. Right, right, and Bill's right. very like if Bill goes like someone goes. Bill's very literal. If someone goes, "Hey man, I don't want to be that guy," then Bill will go, "Then don't, then don't, <laughs> then don't." He's so cool though, dude. I met him through uh, Dean Del Rey. Yeah, and, uh, I, we went down. We we saw them. It's probably one of the last shows that we actually got to see 
And uh, they played here in Vegas and fucking dude, he crushed and went backstage and was so fucking cool, man. Like, I, well, you've, I, I got love currency. you've got currency with Bill because Bill's more interested in music than he is comedy. Right, right, right. Then uh, Homeboy, who played drums for, the, uh, for Stevie Ray Vaughan, was there. So he was like super geeking out because like, like, he's a drummer, you know? So he was yeah. like doing his thing and me and Dean were hanging out. And yeah, it was, it was a fucking cool night. Yeah, Bill's, Bill's an interesting guy. It's interesting. So, you know, you, you've known someone for that long and you, you never think of them as famous because you knew them for, you knew them when they right. were definitely not. Yeah. And to see it happen and then he's kind of, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's really interesting. But yeah, Bill, you have a currency with Bill that, that not, no athletes, well, athletes might have it, but he like, for some reason, music is, I think he looks at athletes as like, you know, I don't know. Bill's also very private. Right, right, yeah. Like Segura, Segura's he's really sport, private too. He's a sport, he's a sports fan, man. So it's like yeah. you know, you could probably see that. Bill comes off as the guy that if there's if there's common ground, he's he'll totally chill and talk with you. You know, if not, it's probably like he because he's so private. There's a there's a wall there, you know. Which I, yeah. I have a lot of friends who are like that, man. Like uh, I have friends in bands who are if it's me and them, very you know, hospitable, very gracious, like talks, talks, talks. But when they go out, it can get punishing, you know? So they, they keep the wall down the entire time, you know, because they have to, because they've been doing it for years, you know? So it's, again, it's one of those things that you don't realize is so taxing because people are just, it's just, you just never know, you know, it's just always happening. I'm so fast. I'm still so fascinated by, the dynamic of nine members in a band touring and being successful and not breaking up. I'm still so fat. There could be a legit documentary by a, so like a psychologist right. on why that works because so many bands don't work. Right. I, I think it's because we all loved, we all love the music that we make together. Like we still get stoked when we like, when we hit on a, a fucking new song and a good song, like, we still get fucking really stoked about it. We still love performing. Like we yeah. all, we hold each other to such a high level of um, like performance that, you know, we, we get on each other if, if, if people aren't like fucking going for it, you know, like I was like, oh, you take the night off. Yeah. Is that, is this your night off tonight? You're not going to fucking do your thing. Like we're out here killing ourselves and shut up, man. I'm fucking sick. You know? It's like, we still fuck with each other. I mean, it's, it's kind of cool too, that we've all known each other this long. We all came from the same spot, you know, I mean, with, with the exception of the new guys who were fans when we, when they, you know, it's, it's fucking crazy, man. We're the same dudes doing this and still doing it and and still getting stoked to do it you know we still do a huddle before every show we still we you know bring the energy in fucking and that makes so much shit go away you know like even if you're you know i mean we got people in their 50s now in this pants so even if you're an old curmudgeon hanging on to shit and you know personalities rub when you get in that huddle, you chuck it out, man, because it's it's game time and it's time to go. And that it's, you know, you're talking about thousands of people who are ready for you to just lose your mind. And that can make a lot of shit go away, you know? The this is the hackiest question, and I'm sure you get you get answer, asked it all the time. And I'm but I'm but I gotta ask about the masks and and about the the who made the okay? Here's my things. Did who made them originally? Is the same person still making them? Do do can can people buy them? Do people wear them to shows? I know they smell. They have to smell horrific. Oh, yeah, they're, they're fucking gorgeous. But like like oh. I'm dying to know about the mask. Like when when you joined the band, did, was there like a group meeting? You're like, so we need some masks. We should all talk about what how that mask should go. When I joined the band, the masks were already in place. The mask idea came from clown wearing his mask at practice like and this is all like this is legend because this was obviously before i was in the band it all came from him showing up to practice one day and just 
caveman the fuck out like on on his drums and shit in his mask and it just took him to this crazy place that he was like feeling so then according to legend um according to lore anyway joey got his white mask and brought and started wearing that and then like as time went on everybody just started kind of getting their own thing and it just happened organically like it wasn't uh something that was really thought out it was just something that people felt and and the masks changed over the years so much like certain people's masks changed dramatically even before we got signed really? um yeah man that was it was cool it's almost like almost like kind of trying to find yourself in that kind of state you know for me the mask has always been a representation of the person inside me who needs this music you know what i'm saying like that's the face of the guy inside me who wants to sing this shit, who wants to feel this shit, who's got something to say. So it's always been that physical representation. When does we first anyone, started, does anyone regret their masks? I'm sure we all do. Every like, fucking like night, Craig, we're, maybe? We're, <laughs> fucking oh, Craig. We, always, we always do it. Like we were sitting down, you know, and some of us are, you know, we put makeup on like underneath it. We just look at each other and we just go, let's wear masks. It's a great fucking idea. What the <laughs> hell? Like, it's just every night you can set your fucking watch to it, dude. We're all sitting there getting ready and just, and there's that moment where you're just like, <sighs> and you put it on, you just, you got, because it's two hours of just pain, man. It's crazy. Oh, it's, 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 I trust me, I'm definitely. Uh, well, we just did Chicago and it was like 32 degrees out and it was snowing right. and, and we're doing outdoor shows. I'm doing drive-ins and I kept, and I kept saying, it's a great idea. Take your shirt off, man. It's yeah. a brilliant yeah. fucking idea. <laughs> Whoever saw yeah. this coming. <laughs> yeah. I, Chris's mask scares me the most. I, by the way, uh, the, the clown is the fucking scares the living fuck out of me. Right. I don't like clowns. I've never liked clowns. I think it's, well, because- especially him. He's got some serious issues that really come out when we're on stage and there's no one to protect us, which is cool. You know, I'm, I'm glad that happened. That's, Oh dude, you have no idea. He used to GG Allen us all the time, dude. Like really first. Oh dude, we could tell it was going to be a special night because he'd be like rubbing his fucking gut and then he'd come out on stage and he'd have shit in both his hands. And he'd be throwing it all over, and it's on my fucking face. So now, not only do I have to sing this crazy shit, but I, I have clowns poop running down my fucking mask like this. And if I wipe it off, I'm a puss, right? If yeah. I, you know, and I'm just like, ah, just oh. He, him and him and Sid used to light my legs on fire every night. Really? Yeah, yeah. We'd be we'd be playing Scissors from the first album. And the whole second half of that song, we would make up like the first half we was, we would do our thing and it was exactly how we wrote it. But then the second half was all made up like full on, like, like artistic, like playing with pedals. And I'm like doing poetry, crazy, like stream of consciousness shit. So I'd be on the ground, little known, like unbeknownst to me, here comes Sid and clown from behind me with lighter fluid. And they're fucking soaking my legs. So I'm on, I'm in like this crazy trance and I'm singing and all of a sudden, uh, fuck, why are my legs hot? Why are my legs hot? I'm fucking, and I'm like rolling around and, oh dude. Yeah. It was, it was insane. It's yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's such a, it, it, it really is an interesting part of the business of, of this weird, sometimes a, a fun idea when you're young, right. Becomes a brand. And you're married to it for the rest of your career. And you're like, you're like, I, I have no problem with it. I love performing shirtless. I, right. I actually enjoy performing shirtless way more than with a shirt. But there right. are times where I'm cold as fuck or I'm doing a quick set. And I don't want to take my shirt off and put it back on again. I'm like, right. I'm up here for an hour. I'll yeah. do it. But come on, man. I'm just doing seven minutes at the store. Like, I'll just, I'm, fuck, it's a lot of movement. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you have a room full of masks? No, I've got them. Uh, a lot of our masks are all kind of kept together. We have a warehouse like, where we keep a lot of our shit. Um, I have a couple of a uh, couple of masks here that I keep for personal reasons. Um, but a lot of my stuff was on display at the Hard Rock for a long time here in Vegas. 
Um, yeah. I had a I had a big uh, display in the Hard Rock uh, Casino, and uh, when that got taken down, they sent it back to management. So I got masks kind of all over the fucking place. But I have a few. Uh, my original mask melted, dude. Like I mean, disintegrated. Like I had it on a fucking mannequin head, and for some reason, between the humidity in Iowa and the crap that had been coming out of my face for years. It melted it. And I mean, melted it. It looked like somebody had sprayed the shit with acid and it was dripping off. I came in the room that I had had it set up and I just went, what the fuck, dude? The buckle was <laughs> hanging on by this piece of rubber. And I just went, what the fuck just happened, dude? Like, it freaked me out. Like, it did, I had to throw it away. Like, so my original is gone, gone. Because it was just, it was disintegrated. There was no saving it. Come on in, Isla. Um, there's a guy at the door. There's a guy at the door? Yeah. About what? I don't know. This guy. The guy at the door, do I know him? I don't know. I'm probably don't know. Who's the guy? I don't know. I'm going to do that. Fucking shit. Can you give me one second? Yeah, man. Yeah. Do I'm sorry. Thing. There's someone at my front door. And no, 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 no. Yeah, I totally understand. Give me one second. Give me one second. I'm so sorry. Give me one oh, second. That's okay, man. Yeah, do your thing. All right, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Sorry about that. That's okay, man. My hey, daughters, no, my daughters are useless. I, I, nay, I I got kids. I totally get it. Um. All right, I'm gonna bring Halston back on. Halston. Yo. Okay, Halston. This is uh, Halston. Halston is a uh, is a musician, but more importantly, a huge fucking fan, and uh, and he's been <laughs> listening this entire time with bated breath. Halston, what questions didn't I ask that you think I should have asked? Okay, you guys got into some really good vocal stuff. And like, I just want to dive a little deeper into that because um, I was in a metal band at one point as a frontman myself, and we opened up for Soulfly. The only thing I wanted to know was what was Max's warm up? Like someone who screams for over two decades. Is there a scream warm up? Because I know there's warm ups for regular singing. But when I was doing both, it's like, it's so different. And it's like, sometimes you don't want to warm that scream up because you don't want to like ruin it before the show. Like, I want to know about that. Do you have a scream warm up? I, I have a, a slight warm up that I do. I don't do a, an overt warm up because I'm, a, it's my assumption that if you over warm up, you lose a certain tone in your voice and you will thin it out. And that's why I think a lot of people who, they over warm up like for like an hour they come on stage and they just their voice sounds thin you know so for me all i do is basically the first thing i do is is find out how my my voice is feeling if i'm sick i have a whole different thing that i go to where i drink lemon juice and honey warm that up and then mm -hmm. i have a certain warm up that goes with that if i'm if i'm if i'm doing okay then i do uh i do a couple different things where i go <laughs> Now you gotta, you have to excuse me because I've been singing for like five days because I just got done doing a bunch of uh, CMF two demos and uh, in a studio. But um, I have a certain way I scream where I can kind of slide into it, so it's almost like a like that, and you slide up into it. So you're using the very top of your uh, of your uh, vocal cords but it doesn't sound like that kind of inward scream that a lot of people do mine has a little more like girth to it um so i go and then i go and then i go on stage and that's it like, have you ever have you ever opened your mouth and nothing came out oh yeah i've i've, I've had to uh, i've had to cancel four shows in my whole life and it was because I couldn't make a sound. Um, the last time I had uh, canceled like that was, I want to say it was 2006. Uh, it was in Berlin uh, with Stone Sour, actually. And uh, we were on the Come, uh, Come Whatever May tour. And I had just, they had just stacked me with a lot of shows. And if I wasn't doing shows, I was doing TV shows over there. So, so we were doing so I had real no days off it was what they call non show days, which is such horse shit, you know, and uh, so I I got to Berlin. It was, you know, it was one of the biggest shows on this on the on this on the tour. And 
I literally couldn't make a sound. Like, I mean, and I did, I like to this day, I can't believe I did this. I took a fucking finger of uh, Vaseline and stuck it down my throat to see if that would work. And it didn't. And I was just like, well, I'm all out of ideas. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. And for real, I was like, I, I had to cancel. We had to cancel that night. And uh, luckily I had two days off after that. Uh, so between those three days, I didn't talk at all. It was total vocal rest um, and just basically sat in my hotel room and w- in total silence and talked to everybody on, uh, on email. That's how I communicated. And then on the fourth day, I was able to you know, kind of finish the tour off. But yeah, it was fucking crazy, man. Um, you, so you haven't had any vocal surgeries at all? No. Uh-uh. The closest I got... I got bit on the top of my head uh, by a spider and it threw. Yeah, it was fucking crazy. We, we stayed at this like super sketchy fucking hotel in New Mexico. Right. And I mean, there was so many, there was so much weird shit. We were trying to save money. It was like a whole fucking thing. There was so much weird shit going on in the fucking hotel room that I, I feel I, I fairly sort of got bit in the night and I woke up. Didn't realize I'd been bit because I got bit in my sleep. And it was so gross in that room. I went and slept on the bus. I was like, I'm fucking gone. I'd rather sleep in my bunk than in this gnarly hotel room. And from that moment on, I was having vocal issues. And I went to a doctor, got scoped. My left vocal cord had swollen up about the size of my thumb. I mean, it was gnarly, gnarly. And I was trying different things and couldn't fucking figure out what the hell was going on. And then I went to a doctor in Denver because I had a rash on the top of my head. It was about this long, dude. And it felt like a fucking mountain range. Like it was insane. He goes, oh, ew, you got bit by a fucking spider. And I went, what? The fuck kind of spider? And he's just like, I don't know, but it was gnarly. He's like, you're very lucky to be okay right now. Give me antibiotics. And the swelling went down. And like and my whole leg was in like so my lymph nodes were like gnarly. As soon as he gave me the antibiotics, it all went away. And so Dude, crazy. Go ahead. Go okay, okay. Yeah, when I when I opened up for Max, like all he did was uh, he sprayed some entertainer secret in his throat. I took a sip of Coca Cola. That for me when I lost my voice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you got to do vocal stuff, warm ups. You got that's a story for another day. <laughs> well, I tell you what, there's a there's a uh, a speaking warm up that you can actually do. Um, and it actually starts with a sort of, uh, ohm sound, like a, almost like a chant where you, uh, you kind of, mm, 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 and you develop this sound that you, then you're speaking and you're basically pushing the sound against the top of your mouth and you're using like about this much of your vocal cords. And it's a great way to not only take the stress off talking but also to um kind of warm up like for like to basically go do what they call you know sorting out the phlegm is how they used to say it like yeah. in the back in the day. yeah it's crazy that's my, my my problem is like phlegm accumulated on the back of my on my vocal cords and getting it off of it and and the other thing is i, th- I don't think i breathe and talk right i think i breathe and talk wrong yeah yeah it could be the the way that could come back to how you're talking as well. Um, there's a lot of people when they talk, they talk from the very back of their uh, vocal cords and you can hear the tonal difference between this and this. Yeah. And that's because you change it and you're, 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 it, it's almost like you're pushing the sound against the top of your mouth. Dude, that's crazy. Uh, keep going. Halston, anything else? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, uh, let's not make a meal out of it. <laughs> I'm not going to be that crazy. No fan that you run into no so, no no because there are there are fans of mine that are listening to this going Bert really dropped the fucking ball in this interview man no, <laughs> so, no, talking no. to fucking Corey motherfucking Taylor bro no dude you did fucking awesome um black eyes blue does that mean you want her to heal you yeah man yeah now that song is actually about my wife um ask that yeah yeah she's uh uh she's my third wife which, uh, you know, my first two, I, I mean, I'm not going to get into that, but my, <laughs> my second, 
my my second relation my second marriage was really gnarly it was really hard on me it fucked me up in a lot of ways um and so i was kind of going to the, through this like crazy uh like rediscovery um moment in my life like for, for probably about a year man like close to a year and that was right around the time she and i met we started like talking we didn't start dating until after we like started like we worked together because she opened a, a tour for me on uh with stone sour with her uh dance troupe the cherry bombs when that happened like she and i like we just we like hit it off hit it off and um and then we were just, you know, once that tour ended, we started dating and we've just been inseparable ever since. And my wife is the kind of person, and, I, and this is an absolute compliment, that she can be in any situation and enjoy herself. I have never seen anything like it. Like, my, she's just so light and happy and wide open, man. She's one of the most fun people to, to watch drink. She's one of the f- most fun people to like hang out with because I don't drink, but you know, she, she has, you know, she has her wine and shit and she's just so smooth and funny. She's fucking so funny. Right. And we were in London together and she'd never been to London. I've been a million times and you know, you hit that, that moment in your, tr- your travels where it's just like, yeah, fucking, you know, whatever, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. You're defining me and my family right now. Keep right. going. She lights up, man. She's just like, we're going to fucking go do this, 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 this. And I felt myself almost against my will becoming so stoked about going and doing it. And me kind of forgetting like how awesome it is that I get to do this, you know, and get to see the world and, and experience and go to see these museums and these places, and especially in the UK, which is like my favorite country in the world. Like, of, of everywhere yeah and so that was the the inspiration for this song was you know her taking that darkness in me and really helping me let go of it you know all this really bitter anger that i've had from you know from the past call it eight years and letting go of that and really seeing how wonderful life can be if you let go of some of that shit so it's making my black eyes come back to blue, you know? And uh, yeah, it's, it's probably one of my favorite songs I ever wrote. That's so, so beautiful, man. I mean, and it's one of those simple lyrics too, where I was like, fuck, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> like, it's so, and it's so good. I got like two more statements and one question. Okay. Um, so volume three has no curse words in it? No, no. Um, I say Jesus, but that's it. No, I... I did. I, I mean, it was such a, a big fuck you to everybody who said I couldn't write lyrics without cursing. I mean, that's the whole reason I did it. It's because everybody's like, oh, typical Corey Taylor fashion, you know, they're profanity laced fucking saw blood. And I went, really? All right, motherfucker, check this out. And I, the whole album is not one. The, 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 the closest I come is the, the Christian curse, basically, you know, but, yeah. you know, I don't give a fuck about that. Well, it was like a huge hit too. So like, what an awesome fuck you. Exactly. And dude, House of Golden Bones part one and two is the best concept album since Operation Mindcrime. Oh, I, come on, dude. That's okay. Now that's huge because that fucking album is ridiculous. Like that's not so much the second one, but the first one is amazing. Well, dude, I appreciate that, man. Fuck. Thank you. I, I, I can't get enough. I, I can listen to it every single day. Um, so last thing I was trying to explain to my girlfriend metal and slipknot. Hold on. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She was trying to explain to me gossip girl. (laughs) You're going to lose me. And we just warning you now you're going to lose me because I don't know if I can. Yeah. (laughs) We both, we both just couldn't understand each other. Okay. Could you explain metal and what metal means to metalheads to a valley girl? Yeah. Metal to a metalhead. I mean, the only thing that can really put it in perspective is metal to a metalhead is as, is as important as 
the best selfie on Instagram to a Valley girl. You know, like it's that, it's that constant search for the angle, you know, that the little puffy, you know, getting the, the, the sun, right. The background. Oh shit. That's the leaning tower of Pisa. Look at that motherfucker. You know, like to, uh, to that's what it metal is to us is that perfect riff, that perfect solo, that, that perfect blast. And then it just breaks down hard with a fucking halftime. You're just like, oh, and your fucking head explodes. You know, that's probably the only gateway that I can even try and find that bridge, you know, of, of, of understanding, you know, because I'm, I'm assuming she takes a lot of selfies. Uh, She's not one of those people, but she just doesn't gossip girl. There's gotta be something in her. Yeah, she's That's 24. Right. Okay. Like, I was just telling her that it's a it's a space where these angsty people can go, where nothing else gives that to them. And there's something right. called scream therapy too. Right. Oh, oh, did it, we did it in the cabin. Yeah, you guys did it in the cabin. Yeah, and it's it's, it's that too. It's therapy. It's healing and she's like well you're angry i'm like no i'm not angry because of this right this is why i'm not angry because i fucking get it out right i get it out of my body and that's what that is yeah. and uh yeah i just wanted to know what your take on on that was like how would you explain slip not to i mean world? yeah dude i mean it's it's so hard to explain to someone what i call inert anger which is i I used to call it the irish you know my irish is getting up Mm -hmm. just because being irish and german you're just kind of born angry you know really nothing specific to be fucking pissed about you're just double trouble where you're just you know um there's things that happen to you in life that encourage that and and make it grow but because of that music, it can even you out and it can allow you to function. It can allow you to kind of get your shit together. It can allow you to understand and have empathy for other people instead of being locked because people who don't have that and have those issues get so locked in self-pity sometimes, um, self, self-emulation. Like they just, they can't get past that, that fucking ball of shit that's right here, you know? And because of that, those are the people who really take a turn for the worse. And people who, people who don't live in a, a, a state of kind of like just idling anger can't understand that just because we're hanging and chilling doesn't mean that there's something that I need to just can get out you know and they also the flip side of that is that they can't understand why if i am angry why aren't I just angry all the time it's like well it's not a switch it's it's triggered but by listening to music and having the outlet you can keep that shit at bay is it hard to go to that place sometimes when you're on the road because you kind of have to bring it back because people fucking won't believe you i I have it. I, I'm, it's very easy for me to tap into. To be <laughs> I remember every shitty thing that ever fucking happened to me. Like, and I mean, everyone it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, to be honest. You know, it helps me be able to kind of empathize with other people's issues, but it also allows me to be able to put things in perspective and write about modern issues that I have. You know, like I'm obviously not going to write about being a teenager when I'm almost 50. That would be fucking shit, you know, but I understand the type of anger that comes from that, you know, and even though it's, it's a more mature anger, it's still that kind of, you know, that, that urge to just fucking, ah, you know, lose your fucking shit. So that helps me keep my writing honest and also it helps me keep it um, not current, but relatable, basically, you know? 
Um, and because of that, that means that there's a straight line between everything I write now and everything that I've ever written, you know, and that helps me. It, it makes it easier. Like if you're all over the place and you don't relate to these things that you write, then it's harder to kind of find that headspace, you know, but for me, it's a straight fucking line. I can get right back to where I was on this day, on that day, on this moment, what this song is about. And it, that kind of recall is, it's exhausting, but it's also, it, it fills the tank enough that when you're on, a, on stage with, with that kind of show, you just, oh, fucking come down on it, you know? That speaks to exactly what you guys were talking about earlier. Bert was, you guys were talking about how so many people are gravitated towards you and like, right. They yeah. are just stuck like glue to you and you weren't really sure why, but it's, it is that line. It's the line that's rooted in honesty and that it, makes sense. Yeah. If you were not it's, honest, yeah. these people wouldn't believe you and they wouldn't be able to get their own shit out from your shit because that's, you that's be a real. good fucking point, man. Like I, and it makes sense because and it makes sense to the fact that why we're still here because it's, you know, my methods haven't changed. My message hasn't changed. You know, it's, it's all about being yourself in this thing. You know, it may not look like you, but it is you and people can feel that. It's and not really, I was really, it, you're, I, I, you guys, what, when you were talking about that, I, I kept going to myself What's beautiful about music is there are so many different genres and people can just very easily go, oh, I'm not into, I'm not into metal. I'm more into hip hop or I'm not into hip hop. I like folk music. Right. What thinks about comedy is everyone, <laughs> there aren't, there aren't a ton of genres. You've got like sketch and stand up and, right. movies, and people assume because they like to laugh that they can get all comedy and then they can just go, Oh, your comedy sucks. And you're like, well, no, <laughs> there's some genres, man. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's a good point, man. You know, I mean, that, and that's, again, one of the reasons why what you guys do is so hard. I mean, and when it's done right, which like you, Bill, Tom, it's fucking awesome, you know? And it's, I, as a fan, I hope, you know, we all appreciate it. Oh, okay. bro. Dude, Don't give real. me you have no idea how much I appreciate fucking Slipknot on a treadmill. Dude, I'm <laughs> sitting there murdering it. And I'm like, fuck, man. I wonder how skinny I would have been if I had been listening to Slipknot the entire fucking pandemic. As skinny as me. Uh, as skinny as Halston. Dude, that's it. Dude, well, thank you know what? The, as a comedy fan and a Slipknot fan, you guys can't speak to this because you're in it. You're too close to it. I'm a fan for the exact same reasons. I can pop on a comedy special at night when I'm at my lowest, when I'm at my darkest, and I can laugh. I can assume, yeah. I can have a place to put my head right before I go to sleep so I don't wake up angry or depressed. I can pop on a Slipknot song and scream it out in my car and listen to Nero Forte and fucking drive fast, dude. That song makes me want to drive so fast. And... It's the exact same thing. And for that, I thank you both. Wow. Hey, it's a great way to end an episode, Halston. Pretty rad. <laughs> Dude, I got to tell you, man, Corey, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a blast. I, I really, my pleasure, man. I, I, I can't tell you how cool it is for you to hop on for as long, too. It's been an hour and 45 minutes. So uh, I'm like, hey, man, I've just been putting off cleaning my house. So it's fine. It's all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can't wait till things loosen back up and I'm back in Vegas and we get to hang. Dude, yeah, man. Fucking hit me up anytime. We'll come down. We will hang. Fucking hard hangs. Absolutely. I'm a lot cooler with than Bill in my green room. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it, man. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Hey, stay safe. Take it easy, guys. See ya. Later. <laughs>